Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Reyes. I'm the editor of the Gibraltar Chronicle. I want to start with an apology for not being able to be there with you in person today. Uh, unfortunately, my diary clashed with the, the timing of the seminar. So um, after Pina reached out, I promised that I would uh, record a few words so that uh, she could include it during the uh, proceedings of the seminar. Um, I want to start just by talking a little bit about the newspaper so that you understand who we are. Um, we're a daily newspaper. We publish in print six days a week, but we also have an online presence, um, just like any newspaper around the world. We cover uh, international affairs as they relate to Gibraltar primarily, and also all the um, uh, affairs of the community life you know, in, in, in all its shapes and, and forms. Um, the paper is owned by a, a trust, it's a civilian newspaper, it's held by a trust uh, for the benefit of uh, the people of Gibraltar, so it has no direct uh, ownership as such. Um, but it's very different to the newspaper that existed in uh, 1891 at the time of the uh, Utopia tragedy. Back then the Gibraltar Chronicle was a, a newspaper that was owned by the military garrison. It was established in 1801. So by the time of the Utopia tragedy, it was already, uh, it had already been in print for 90 years, which is quite something if you think about it. The uh, Gibraltar Chronicle is actually one of the oldest English language newspapers still in continuous uh, publication. So it had been going for 90 years by the time the Utopia sank in the Bay of Gibraltar. Um, but it was a military newspaper, so it was very different to uh, uh, the product that we produce today. It was a, a newspaper that was designed to inform primarily the officers of the garrison about events around the world, and also it doubled up as a, an official gazette for public notices uh, that the community needed to know at that time. Um, the editor at the time was a, a gentleman called Major Grogan. He was an officer of the Black Watch Regiment. Uh, and even though the, the, the newspaper, even visually, is very was very different then to what we have now, primarily in the sense that it was text-based, it was literally just uh, words, um, I see a lot of the traits and a lot of the um, uh, approaches that a, a modern journalist would uh, take, uh, particularly in the coverage of the utopia. So. Um, if, I, if we just reflect a little bit on that, um, when, I, when I looked back over the, the copy that had been produced uh, at the time, um, I can immediately relate to what the news team at that moment went through in those days. I'll give you a very uh, basic example. Um, the Utopia uh, collision happened at around 7 p.m. Uh, that night. And normally at that point, the newspaper would be starting to wrap up the day's edition. But if you look at the edition of March the 18th of 1891, so the following day, um, you can tell that they scrapped what they had on page two, which is where the story ran, and they filled it with a very vivid, very lengthy, very detailed account of what had happened the night before. So they clearly scrapped everything that they had that day and you know, worked late into the night to make sure that the next day's edition uh, had the latest, uh, the latest news. It didn't make the front page, which is quite interesting. Um, at the time, the Chronicle's front page was primarily uh, um, dedicated to uh, international news. And even uh, though this had been such a dramatic uh, seismic incident in the community, that's what went on the front page the following day. But the account inside, um, is a, a, a very uh, lengthy, detailed uh, account that drew on eyewitness reports and official reactions and included names of who had gone out to, uh, to try and rescue uh, the people uh, from the, the survivors from the utopia who had lost their lives. It was, it was a remarkable effort um, for uh, a, a very small newspaper, which is what it would have been at the time and what it remains today. We're a very small team of people. Um, over the ensuing days, the, the Chronicle covered uh, multiple uh, lengthy articles, uh, almost daily for the best part of you know, uh, three or four months, really, um, reporting on uh, the events again of the night, 
the official reactions afterwards, the inquests, the uh, the court proceedings, um, the, the Marine Court proceedings, uh, every aspect of this tragedy was covered in remarkable detail by uh, the people of the Gibraltar Chronicle uh, at that time. Um, vivid, highly detailed reports. It's a cliche to say that journalism is a first draft of history, but, but frankly, this is exactly what we have in the newspaper uh, coverage of the Utopia shipwrecks. And, and when, when I read those accounts, and when anybody reads those accounts today, um, you can see that they have stood the test of time, because really, not only are they uh, providing you with the raw detail, the, the, the facts of, of what had uh, happened and what was known at that time, but also um, they, they, uh, they are as dramatic today as they must have been back then. I mean, it, it was such a, a huge uh, um, incident that had such a massive effect on this community. And that is another issue that really comes through in, in the coverage of uh, the Utopia uh, tragedy in the Gibraltar Chronicle. And it's something that I actually relate to because I can see, uh, I can see the community that I know today reflected in that coverage. And that is the way that everybody rallied around uh, uh, in, in response to this uh, horrific disaster in the Bay. Um, there were, uh, uh, even on the first day, there was an appeal for clothing in the newspaper for, for the survivors and people responded to that. Um, the community rallied round. There was a, a fund that was set up to, to raise money for the survivors, um, to help them in any way. Um, and it's just so typical of uh, Gibraltar where this, this close-knit community really drops everything uh, in a flash to, to pull together and, and, and to help others who need it. And I see, that is something that I see uh, to this day in this community, and I think is reflected in the um, in the coverage of the utopia, and it also shows um, when you read it carefully the uh, the huge uh, sad impact that it had uh, on this community, where many people, let's not forget, um, it, it had arrived here from other parts of the Mediterranean, from other parts of the world, to to set up here and to to service the the, the needs of the military garrison at the time. But that is the origin of uh, the roots of the, the civilian community of Gibraltar. It's people coming in from other parts of the Mediterranean, from other parts of the world. So there was, I, I suspect that there was, from Italy actually, quite a few people. So there, there must have been a link, uh, an emotional link to, to, to seeing what had happened to these uh, unfortunate uh, people who were on the uh, utopia. Uh, and I just wanted to end as well with um, uh, an assurance that uh, even though 130 years have passed since the utopia sank, and obviously um, this incident drifts from, from the collective memory, um, it's still something that for many people is very much alive. And I include myself in that, um, and I include uh, my readers in that. And I, and I just want to let you know that today on the 130th uh, anniversary of the, um, the thinking of uh, the SS Utopia, uh, the Gibraltar Chronicle has again run a, an entire full page of material to remind people of what happened in the Bay of Gibraltar on that tragic night. And so with my apologies once again for not being able to join you in person, um, I look forward to watching the, uh, the, the, the video of this session because I, I think I will find it very interesting. Uh, but again, with apologies for not being able to be there with you, uh, I'm going to hand over back to Pina. Thank you very much. <laughs>